Well, welcome to yet another podcast here from Concordia Theological Seminary. I'm Professor Ryan Teets. I teach Old Testament here at the seminary. And welcome to Christmas 1. And welcome to a text that has more possibilities than one could really conceivably work with during this Sunday in which I'm sure you'll have record levels of attendance. After all, it's Christmas 1. Uh, that said, let's take a look at Isaiah 61, verse 10 through 62, verse 3. I'm hoping, perhaps unjustifiably so, that two weeks before this, you preached already on Isaiah 61, 1 to 10, which sets the stage for a lot of this. Isaiah 61, if you recall, is this initial uh, servant starting to speak again. Isaiah 61, 1 onward, is important because it's, in many ways, Jesus' self-understanding of his ministry. But now here, as we hit verse 10, we go from the servant talking to a response. And in these two sections, Isaiah 61, 10 to, the, to 61, 11, and then 62, 1 through 3, we have this great movement between Zion speaking and Yahweh's response. That said, let's take a look at how this text starts here in verse 10. With the shosh ashish, in terms of grammar, note how the language of praise is emphasized here. Shosh, for those of you keeping score at home, is, a, is an infinitive absolute, followed by ashish. You'll see that this is the exact same verbal root. This is Hebrew's way, uh, Hebrew way of, emphasize, of emphasis. So perhaps translate that as, I will greatly, I will truly result in Yahweh. Even more, we go from the speaker to nafshi. My very being, that's probably the best way to take nefesh, Typically render that as self. My very being, and this is from Gil, will give a ringing shout in my God. This movement here is pretty important in that suddenly Zion bursts onto the scene. Zion bursts onto the scene for all kinds of reasons. And it gets better. Note the key clause, because. Because he has, that's a hifil, the hey hirik tells you that's a hifil stem. Because he has clothed me with garments of salvation, with garments of salvation, and this word is sort of odd, it's from yaat, yaat, uh, hapax legomena, welcome to Isaiah, it happens all the time, uh, he has clothed me. Isaiah has been waiting over and over again. This actually takes us back to Isaiah 2, which is that initial, the initial Zion chapter. We've been expecting Zion to be restored and all these good things to happen. We've been expecting especially, the, especially Zedekah to be there, uh, God's righteousness. And now finally here, here we have it actually coming to fruition. We've gone from the servant to now Zion responding because the servant has accomplished his mission. And it gets better. Like a bridegroom, the Hatan. Uh, this word itself is sort of odd. Uh, it's from kahain, which means to play the priest. Here, typically rendered as to uh, put on a priest's turban. So like a bridegroom, he puts on a turban of beauty. And like a bride who puts on her finery, her and that's kali. Uh, kali, if you recall, re can refer to all kinds of things. Uh, vessels, weapons, here probably just ornaments. Uh, some words give lexicographers lots of fun. Kali is high on that list. But now we get to the climax. Why does Zion, why does Zion rejoice? The poetry here is actually pretty powerful. The, word, the letter you're going to see is sade, sade, sade. Sa, sa, sa. Oh, and again here. Ki ka eretz. Totsi Zimaha, as the earth brings forth its, its sprouts, like a garden, its produce, it makes sprout. Note that tsa 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 tsa, it almost gives an onomatopoetic quality of how all the springing forth, all the new life happens. Cain Adonai, Yahweh, Yatzmiak, thus the Lord Yahweh will cause Zedekah, righteousness to sprout, and to praise before all the peoples. 
Here we have one of these moments in which the hope of Isaiah 2 for the restoration of Zion, the, inaugural, the inauguration of the eschatological kingdom of God happens, or even the goyim, the nations come. From this moment of Zion rejoicing, we enter in back into a tension that exists really throughout much of the book of Isaiah. Zion has been promised to be restored. However, a problem still exists. Namely, why has it happened yet? We go from promise to a purpose clause, the Lama'an. For the sake of Zion, I will not keep silent. Up until this point, 10 and 11, we have nothing but this great praise of, of Zion saying all the reasons why she will rejoice. Now we move on to verses 1 to, 1, 62, 1 to 3. And in this, we find out what, hap what happens instead. Namely, that, God is going to, that God's going to make it happen. Yahweh is the one who speaks. Lama'an Zion, for the sake of Zion, I will not keep quiet. Note the repetition of purpose clauses. We have a Lama'an and a Lama'an, for the sake of. For the sake of Jerusalem, I will not hold back. And now here we go back to Yahweh emphasizing his determination to make salvation happen. So note the dynamic. Servant, beginning of 61, Zion responds in song to the servant's saving actions, to now God re-emphasizing the saving action. This persistent pursuit, this persistent bringing about of the eschatological reign of God. Until Zedekah again, righteousness, Yashuta, salvation. Until her, until her righteousness goes out like the dawn and salvation like a burning torch will burn. And now the promise of the nations. The goyim again will see your righteousness, all the kings of the earth, your glory. The language of glory is, sort, is relatively important here. This actually takes us way back to Isaiah chapter 40, uh, verse 5, in which the promise of glory was already given. And now the emphasis is that the glory, the kavod, will actually happen. And now we get into the punchline of the passage. And frankly, if I were to preach on this text, I would actually add verse 4. Because verse 4 really does clarify everything else. You will be called by a new name. The language here is probably that of a bridal feast, the marriage of Zion to Yahweh. And with a new name comes a new destiny. Note the speaker, P. Yahweh, because Yahweh uh, will, will, will speak it. And it will be for you, and now the, here's where we get the bridal language. And Eterah hath tafir, which is a a uh, crown of beauty in the hand of Yahweh. Uh, this word itself is fairly obscure. You'll notice there's a kathib kare on it. It means a diadem, perhaps, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. The language becomes that with Yahweh's actions, Zion is exalted. And now we get to verse 4. Admittedly, the lectionary stops at verse 3, but verse 4 gives us, in many ways, the transformation that happens. You will no longer be called, again, Atzuba, abandoned, and your land, it will no longer be called Shemama, almost sounds like an Ewok phrase, here, desolated, except to you, it will be called Hepzibah, my delight is in her, and to your land, it will be called married. This text ends up with a pretty wonderful climax. Note how we move from Yahweh's determination to come here at the beginning, and in verse 4, we go into the new name. If you were to preach this text, you have plenty of possibilities. Possibility number one would be to simply focus in on 61, one to th 61, or 61 verses 10 and 11. Uh, this gives us possibilities to the fact that we can really emphasize the praise that happens in response to the divine intervention bringing about the eschatological reign of God. It's Christmas. It's a time for a party. It's a time to celebrate. The other thing, and I would probably lean towards this, is to actually instead preach in, on 62, 
1 to 3 and even verse 4. During these passages, we go back to the tension. We go from being an excited celebration to the eschatological tension, the tension of God not of waiting for the consummation of the kingdom. And I would use 62, 1 to 4 to emphasize that, that even in the midst of waiting for Christ's second advent as we celebrate his first advent this Christmas time, that we hang on to the reassurance that God is determined to come again, not only as that babe in Bethlehem, but also the Lord of all at the king at uh, Lord of all at the end of at the end of time. A possibility is galore, and I pray that you really mind this text. Play around with the name changes. Play around with the ch- transformation, the bridal image. Any one of these metaphors gives you a chance to proclaim the gospel in vivid forms, in pretty vivid terms, during this Christmas. Christmas 1, this Sunday after Christmas. Again, enjoy these texts. Savor this sacred time. Rejoice greatly with God your Savior. Rejoice greatly with the prophet Isaiah who gives us this message to preach for this Sunday. God's blessings upon your ministry, my friends. Here from Concordia Theological Seminary, I'm Professor Ryan Teets.